Today we have with us a dear friend and brother of mine, Father Deacon John Gresham Jr. He's a native of King William County, Virginia and a graduate of Virginia State University. He studied at the Virginia Union University School of Theology and was a pastor of Trinity Baptist Church, West Point. He converted to Orthodox Christianity in 2014 and completed the St. Stephen Certificate in Orthodox Theology Studies in 2018. The same year, Deacon John was ordained to the Holy Diaconate by His Grace Bishop Thomas. Deacon John serves at St. Basil the Great Parish in Hampton, Virginia. He has served on the National Board of the Fellowship of St. Moses the Black. He is a ranger at York River State Park in Williamsburg and teaches early African Christianity for the St. Athanasius Academy and is the author of Become All Flame, Lent with African Saints, published by Park and Books. Now there's also another great fun fact about Deacon John Gresham. He is also a dear brother and member of the Divine Nine, the historic Black fraternities and sororities. I'm sorry to say that my dear brother did not have the principles and virtue to be a part of the greatest fraternity known to God and man. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the good news. The <laughs> Welcome, Deacon John. How are you? Good afternoon. Doing great. It's a pleasure. <laughs> um, Father Samuel, uh, great to be with you again. Um, and I just want to, um, first of all, congratulate you, even though you missed the boat on the right frat, but, um, <laughs> but still. But, but still, you know, you are indeed um, an inspiration and a leader among um, African-American Orthodox Christians here. And um, I thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this project. Thank you, dear brother. Thank you so much. Let's jump into our questions. So Deacon John, you entered the Orthodox Church as a former Baptist and were a Baptist pastor before your conversion. Can you please share with us a little bit about that journey and the experience that went along with it? Well, I'll say this. I was raised to, number one, love Jesus Christ. Number two, to pray. And I had a pastor that used to always say that much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. Some prayer, some power. No prayer, no power. And I was <laughs> always wondering, well, what does much prayer look? Because I always knew, I, I, I had friends in Islam who would always make sure they had their prayer five times a day. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, well, gee, I'm Christian. Why don't I have this sort of prayer discipline that my Muslim friends do? And then I looked into the fact that, wait a minute, first of all, Christianity came before Islam. And then secondly, yeah, we've been praying the hours all the time mm -hmm. and that we have had structured prayer disciplines mm -hmm. all the time and that was something that we had lost in modern day Protestantism mm -hmm. and after visiting Kenya not long after um, right after I got out of college um, that's where I had take, I'd seen a couple of glances of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And after I came back to the United States, I had a chance to visit St. Cyprian of Carthage Orthodox Church, which at the time, they were located at about a few blocks north of the Virginia Union University campus. So... Um, I had the opportunity to learn about orthodoxy, mm -hmm. especially the fact that orthodoxy embraced people of all races, of all parts of the world. Because of course, Cyprian of Carthage, you know, Cyprian of Carthage, Carthage, where's Carthage again? Africa, okay. And they also had a full-sized icon of St. Moses the Black as well. So that began to open my eyes about the depth of Orthodox Christianity and the depth that Africans played in Orthodoxy. 
Mm -hmm. I put orthodoxy on the back burner because at the time I was studying um, through the Evan Smith program at theology at Virginia Union University. And I was, I also became the pastor of Trinity Baptist Church. So I was thinking I'm doing fine with what I'm doing right now. But mm -hmm. it's almost as if there was something constantly pulling me for something deeper, a deeper life of prayer, a deeper knowledge of the role of Africans in early Christianity. The Baptist church was not giving that to me. Right. And the more I looked at orthodoxy, the more I looked at the desert fathers of Egypt, the more I looked at how men such as Athanasius and Cyril played major roles in the development of the church and that the prayers of St. Macarius, um, the writings of St. Moses, these things were known by Serbians, Russians. Right. And here I am, an African-American, and I don't even know who a Macarius is. Mm -hmm. So I tried to share what I learned as a Baptist, and I got to a point where either I had to leave what I had found, mm -hmm. or I would have to leave the Baptist church. And one of my mentors, um, pastor who had known me ever since I was a child, he told me, John, if you don't leave the Baptist church and become Orthodox, you are going to be bored and frustrated. Mm -hmm. So I left Trinity and leaving um, Trinity, first of all, leaving a church that you have been the pastor of, mm -hmm. that was a challenge. And at the time, um, the church I was going to, St. Basil, in, in Hampton, Virginia. At the time, it wasn't in Hampton. It was in Pocosin, Virginia. And anybody who knows anything about the state of Virginia knows that Pocosin was not necessarily a welcoming place for African Americans. So I had to face those challenges. But through it all, I, I faced those challenges and I thank God for the challenges. Actually, Pocosin wasn't as bad as, as its history. But um, we did make the move to Hampton. Um, so yeah, it's been you know, Deacon John, I want to thank you for sharing uh, an intimate experience with us. You know, I just saw an article yesterday of a Benedictine nun uh, whose body was interned and it's now been found that <clears throat> her body's incorrupt. And I was speaking with two of my parishioners um, about it and how the report was that it was indistinguishably incorrupt. And I shared with them how the Black American experience is so unique and so tied to our tradition in Orthodoxy when it comes to suffering and sacrifice, that as much as a people, uh, as Africans in the diaspora in the West, that we've tried to separate ourselves from that experience of suffering uh, through slavery, reconstruction, uh, Jim Crow, semi-segregation, um, it's, it's clear to me that in our cultural experience, this is the best way to be saved and to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's, there's a certain level of sacrifice that the Black family has had to go through in the Americas in order to be a Christian alone, yet also have to deal with the experience of oppression, prejudice, uh, racism on a daily basis and like a historic town where this parish was located. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Mm. I believe it will be uh, a great help to some of our viewers and how they're struggling uh, with the choice of coming into the church or staying where they're at. Uh, having had this experience, what do you think Orthodox Christians should know or understand in order to effectively reach out to those who come from a similar background? Well, I would say, first of all, that African Americans, we are very, very wedded to the tradition of our Black church and 
the role that the church had played in our development in this country. Um, we can go all the way back to um, actually the early 1700s, not far from where I work in Williamsburg, Virginia, there is First Baptist on Scotland Street, which is the probably the first um, African-American Baptist church that was established. And that church um, had a mixture of free Blacks and enslaved Africans. So the church has been a part of our struggle um, since the 1720s. And I think that if orthodoxy is going to really have an impact with sharing the gospel with African Americans, it has to respect the history. It has Absolutely. to respect the history um, because the history is quite significant in how we were formed. But also with respecting the history, adding to the history, because again, um, First Baptist Scotland, Scotland Street was formed in the 1720s, but what happened before the 1720s? What right. was there before the 1720s? So this, this is where um, orthodoxy can make a connection that Christian history mm -hmm. is deeper than just the American experience. And that the experience of our Orthodox brothers and sisters also has some pain and struggle as well. Certainly the Greeks who had suffered oppression under the Turks, certainly um, the Russians under the um, atheist Bolsheviks. So we, we have to see the commonality of struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think that seeing that commonality will help build a bridge between us. Um, it, it's going to take bridge building, but not just, we're going to evangelize to African Americans. No, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to evangelize to us because we know Jesus too. Absolutely. Evangelize with us. Now you're talking. Because right. we, we, we can share experiences. We, we can share um, not only sufferings, but also the joy that we had through those sufferings. Um, also the heroes that we had developed through those sufferings. So yeah, I, I, I would say that it's going to be a matter of not so much evangelizing to us as African-Americans, but evangelizing with us as African-Americans. Thank you so much for that word. It really has um, taken on what we're trying to share and convey during the series. Deacon John, you have written extensively about the stories of African saints and their lives, including your recently published book, Become All Flame, Lent with the African Saints. Why is it so important to draw attention to their lives from an education and evangelism perspective? Well, it's been said in an old African proverb that if you don't know where you're coming from, you won't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. So certainly um, knowing our history, and that our history goes beyond um, 1720 or 1619, helps us to build a foundation of bridge building. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the book of Acts, for example, where you had Cyrenians, Africans, along with Greeks in Antioch, and also having these, um, the, these Jews who started believing in Jesus Christ, this unity of people under Jesus, uh, under the gospel, is, is what brought us all together. And you won't know that unless you know the history of it. The history of the fact that for the first 300 years, it didn't matter whether if you were Black, White, Asian, polka dot, purple, whatever, you were persecuted because you were Christian, not because of your skin color, but because of your faith. Also, that in the Roman and the Byzantine empires, the races were not black, white, and Asian. In the um, Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, the races were Christian, pagan, and Jew. Mm -hmm. So whatever you look like, you if you were a Christian, you were a Christian, simple as that. And that we all suffered. Um, during those first 300 years. 
um, no matter what race we were. And then after um, Constantine became emperor and you had the era of the um, Desert Fathers of Egypt, well, not all of the Desert Fathers were African. There were, there were some mm -hmm. like Arsenius of Rome and, and Evagrius. I think Evagrius went everywhere. I found Ev Evagrius in the um, Syriac Fathers. So oh, wow. there, there were people from all races came to the deserts to develop monastics. And then going into um, the church itself, Athanasius, Cyril, they were in some sort of racial vacuum, but they were a part of the whole church and the explanation <laughs> of the faith for the whole church. So once when we know the history of the whole church, and how Africans were a part of the whole history of the church. It's not so much that, okay, the Africans were here, the um, Asiatics were here, and the Europeans were somewhere else. No, we were all together. Mm -hmm. The Mediterranean world was all together. And even those parts of the world, such as Western Europe, such as um, Persia and India, even going down into Nubia, you know, th those churches had connections with the rest of the Mediterranean world. So we were all a part of one another and our history shows that we were all a part of one another. Thank you for sharing the Catholicity of the church. I think it's very important, especially today with the growing Vigant movement uh, here in America, that's been a, a focal point of their, I don't want to say selling, but their presentation of their movement and trying to get Baptists, non-denominationals, and Pentecostals that are interested in uh, the so-called ancient faith and ancient tradition within their confessions to draw them into the Vagant movement. Thank you so much, Deacon John. Please share with us, how do you use the African history of the Orthodox Church to respond to those who associate with Christianity with oppression against communities of color? Uh, many of whom who feel a great connection to pagan and New Age religions or groups like the Hebrew Israelites based on a belief that their ancestors could have not have played a role in the historical Christian church. This is pretty much like a part B of what you just shared. Right. Well, you know, th this is one of the reasons why I started um, blogging about the um, saints of Africa and trying to show the difference between Western Christianity in Eastern Christianity. Um, because if you just look at Catholicism, well, all right, I'll maybe not so much Catholicism because Catholicism did introduce Christianity to the Congo region um, during the medieval period. But even then the Portuguese stabbed the Congo kingdoms in the back and had Congolese Christians as slaves. Um, and, and certainly the Anglican church and then the other Protestant churches they had no idea. If, if you look at Christianity only through those eyes, it's no wonder that so many African Americans don't believe that Christian that blacks had anything to do with Christianity. But going back to um, to the Eastern Christianity, going back to the fact that the Nubian Kingdom, and this is kind of odd because, um, and maybe you you remember this band too, Brand Nubian. Right. Oh, man, I was a devoted brand Nubian fan. <laughs> and the brand Nubians were they were five percenters, um, uh, which right. is an offshoot of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. At the time that group came out, I had no idea that the Nubian Empire was Christian. Right. And that the Nubian Empire lasted almost as long as the Byzantine Empire. Right. And that Nubian Christianity even had some variations that came into um, what, what we now call West Africa. Um, some of the West African kingdoms um, have records of some small African, I mean, some small African Christian groups within their kingdoms. So we have to look deeper than the Christianity that we have been handed. Mm -hmm. Again, I grew up Baptist, grew up Baptist among Baptists. I think my family Looking at both my father's side of the family and my mother's side of the family, we were founders of at least four churches in King William 
Matthews and James City counties. Mm. So yeah, um, I, I come from a Baptist family. But the Baptist church only, like I said, only extends back to 1720 or 1619. Well, actually, 1720. Um, the church mm. doesn't teach. The, the Baptist church does not teach about these, these early African saints. I had to go to orthodoxy to learn that. The prayers of St. Macarius. I found that in two different prayer books. Um, I have a Russian prayer book and an Antiochian prayer book. Well, I saw the, the prayers of, of St. Macarius, an African, an Egyptian. The Baptists had not been teaching these things. So, you know, when you see somebody who's a member of the 5% or the, um, or, or the Hebrew Israelites, or even someone who wants to go back and practice um, traditional African religions, um, yeah, we can say, well, they should know, they should know. Why should they know when their pastors and their parents' pastors have not been teaching these things? So it's an uphill battle um, that, that we're going to have to re-educate um, our own people about where Christianity came from. It did not come from London. It did not come from Paris. It did not come from Liz Lisbon. It came from Jerusalem. It came from Antioch. It came from Alexandria. When your book was published, I was so excited to share the information uh, with the local pastors that I know. And it was such a blessing to me uh, this past Lent. How would you encourage parishes to, for example, seek out iconography of African saints or include their stories in sermons and Sunday school programs, not only for the purpose of welcoming people of color, but also educating those already in the church who may fail to realize the immense contributions of early African Christians? Well, I've been blessed to um, <clears throat> teach with the St. Athanasius Academy. And most of my students, if not all of my students are, are, are white. But again, um, I don't think everyone actually understood that, wait a minute, St. Athanasius, he was criticized by his opponents being called the black dwarf. Well, okay, he was short, but what else was it? Um, <laughs> and and, and just, just the fact that you know, we, we've all, and I think, who was it? The late Metropolitan Philip of the Antiochians, of blessed memory, um, said, said that we're accustomed to being in our own little ghettos, our own little Greek ghetto, our own little Antiochian ghetto, our own little, little Russian ghetto. The thing is this, we have to go to each other's ghettos mm -hmm. and even reach into African-American communities as well. And just looking at the fact that a lot of times each one of the churches that I named, the Antiochians, the Russians, the Greeks, the Serbs, they all have these icons that they've had for thousands of years. They just need to share some of them with us. Right. You know, I, um, now, now you and I, we, you and I both had looked at the Nubian iconography. Mm -hmm. But there's plenty of Russian iconography that has a brown skin Madonna and Christ. There was an icon that I ran into when I was at the, the House of Studies, the Antiochian House of Studies, where, you know, it, it was Christ the King, the Christ the King icon as black. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, where did that icon come from? And, and also the Desus icon where Christ is being pointed to by Mary and by John the Baptist. In the Antiochian Heritage Museum, that icon is there and those are brown skin um, versions of Christ, Mary, and John the Baptist. So it's not so much that the wheel has to be reintroduced. I mean, that the wheel has to be reinvented. We got the wheel. We just need to take it out. 
<laughs> we, we already have it. The, the, the Greeks, the Serbs, the Russians, they already have these things. So it's a matter of sharing what's already there and then adding to, um, to what can be done. Because of course we have some talented iconographers today who right. can also um, <clears throat> write icons of these various saints. Um, but it's gonna take more than just showing pictures of um, St. Moses and St. Athanasius it's going to take everyone accepting everyone else as an icon of God, an icon made by the hands of God. You can't just show me a picture of a black Jesus and then, you know, talk about my social political background like a dog. You can't do that. Um, not saying that everybody is going to agree with everybody else on social political issues, but for goodness sakes, we ought to at least take each other seriously. And even if we don't agree, accept one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. If we do that, if we all do that, that's going to take evangelism a lot easier. Evangelism is going to be so much easier if we begin with the icon that we see in front of us, the other mm -hmm. human being we see in front of us. Then you can take a picture, you know. But but we ha we have to take the time and take the mental and spiritual effort to love one another. And with that, we can also um, introduce the iconography. We're blessed to have um, Jeff Edens as the iconographer <clears throat> at St. Basil, and he's been doing a wonderful job of of reaching out to myself and to others about um, bringing in more of the icons that represent people of the world, not just of one part of the world. Thank you, Deacon John. In our intro, although I joked about it, I was very <clears throat> happy to hear years ago that not only in your upbringing, uh, were you raised traditionally a Baptist, but also being a member of the Divine Nine, before we go, would you please share with us your love letter uh, to Black Americans and HBCUs uh, that are part of the Divine Nine, whatever fraternity or sorority they may be a part of, to your brother Alphas, on how the principles and traditions that you learn uh, in your fraternity and also in your Baptist faith were not only reignited, but refined when you became an Orthodox Christian. Well, strangely enough, um, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, founded in 1906. Among the early years of our fraternity, there was an effort to do research about early African history, and especially um, pointing towards the Egyptians as well. Um, the Fraternity itself has always stood for manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind. So this journey into orthodoxy really became more of a spark for me to take up that call of the fraternity to look in to the history of the African and that we had played such a major role in world civilization. And, and that really in, in our various fraternities and sororities, that we should not settle for just the answers that have always been given to us and the ways that have always been taught to us. Um, we, have called, we have been called to be leaders in our community. You know, we've, yes, been, we've been called to be leaders in the African-American community and to share what we have learned and to share what we have um, come to know as the truth. Um, it's been a blessing for me to um, talk with, you know, some of my brothers and, and some of my friends in other organizations about what I've been finding in, um, in orthodoxy and the, president, the presence of Africans in early Christianity. So I think that we have a special charge 
as um, members of historically black colleges, historically black um, Greek letter organizations to also share the faith and be spearheads of the faith. Thank you so much. Well, may our Lord grant life, peace, health, salvation, and prosperity in length of days to our dear brothers and sisters in the Divine Nine. May God do the same to your wife and your family and your community back home at St. Basil's. We want to yeah. thank you for being part of our program today. Uh, Deacon John, you're forever, you and your wife are forever in my prayers, and thank you so much for being part of our program today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting me. This has been an enlightening opportunity, and may God continue to bless your efforts and the efforts of Archimandrite Christostom and the OCN in doing these, these videos. Thank you so much, sir. Go to the good news. Bye-bye. Manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind. Amen. Amen. Amen.